Uh, hello, my name is Matthew, and I just read The Greek Interpreter by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a part of my read-along series at Book Club with Steve Donahue, and we're reading Murder Mysteries in the Month of March, and we're reading all the Sherlock Holmes short stories. And I just read one of my favorite all-time short stories, The Greek Interpreter. It might not have uh, my very favorite uh, tale, mystery that has to be solved, but it has some of my favorite moments, uh, favorite uh, bits of dialogue, and brilliant decisions on the part of uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And uh, we've seen in these short stories Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, experimenting and fleshing out the world and um, the characters, the principal characters, Sherlock and Watson. And to keep these stories uh, fresh, we, we, we get bits, new bits of information. Sherlock's uh, early years, his first case, uh, more of a personal life um, from Watson. And so Arthur Conan Doyle decides uh, to introduce a new character, which is a bold decision, and it's going to be a family member. It's going to be Sherlock's older brother. And one of my absolute favorite things, the, the decision on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's part, uh, to me, it was just a stroke of genius brilliant. This whole time we have um, Sherlock, this tour de force, the most uh, brilliant man. We're seeing it through the lens of uh, Watson and, and these chronicles that we're reading, written by Watson. And we learn that Sherlock has a brother, an older brother, a smarter brother, greater powers of perception, greater powers of deduction. And uh, this is brought about with a conversation between Sherlock and Watson. Uh, at the very beginning, Watson um, is telling us that um, Sherlock's personal life, his family history had remained um, a mystery to him, had, had been uh, obscured and evasive um, evaded th th uh, trying to have conversations with Sherlock um, for years and years and years. And so it was to a uh, great surprise to Watson when Sherlock mentions that he has a brother and points out that his brother is more um, adept in the ways of deduction and perception and observation and just um, a more brilliant mind than Sherlock. And uh, Watson uh, responds by saying, uh, that must be your modesty. Sherlock, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not underestimating, I'm not underestimate, underestimating myself. And he says, would you like to meet him? Would you like to meet, meet my brother Mycroft? And so we have this great concept of a character. It turns out to be an iconic character. And then also... Um, a new location, which is um, has become equally iconic, the Diogenes Club, which is um, a, a club in London where people go to be unsociable. Uh, the whole point of the club is that you do not uh, speak, engage, make eye contact with, even recognize the presence of anyone else in the room in, in, in this club. You um, arrive into a large, well-furnished room with comfy, cozy chairs, and you read periodicals. And the whole point is to remain silent. The reason that Mycroft is not... Um, the real world's greatest detective and known all through all the newspapers and uh, 
uh, the highest, uh, most powerful parts of society is that all of his powers of perception and all that go to waste because he's lazy. He's a, a big, large, corpulent man that likes to spend his time uh, sitting silently at the Diogenes Club reading periodicals. Sherlock brings Watson uh, to meet his brother in the club. That They go off to an area in which you're allowed to have conversations. And we, we get a great introduction of um, Mycroft's um, presence being older, larger, um, and still having um, genetic or hereditary um, similarities to Watson, especially um, that sharpness and uh, sparkle and um, in the eyes when someone is fully engaged and their mind is on fire and you can see it uh, through the portal of their eyes. And Watson mentions that he sees this in Mycroft um, the same way that he sees it in Sherlock and has never seen it in anyone else that he's ever met. He describes his hand as a seal's flipper. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I want to read a couple excerpts uh, just because it, it, it's so fun, so enjoyable to read, and <laughs> just so great. So the idea is that Mycroft is just figuring things out uh, lazily. You can uh, gaze at a situation, read a paper. If there's a mystery or a case or something, he just knows exactly what happened. It doesn't bother... Uh, going into the details and particulars of the case and doing all the things that uh, proper law would require in order to bring a mystery to a resolution or um, a um, culprit uh, to justice. And <laughs> so Mycroft and Sherlock start talking <clears throat> and uh, Mycroft says, uh, by the way, Sherlock, I expected to see you round last week to consult me over that manor house case. I thought you might be a little out of your depth. <laughs> Sherlock responds, No, I solved it, <laughs> uh, said my friend smiling. It's Watson talking about Sherlock. Uh, and then Mycroft continues, It was Adams, of course. Sherlock says, Yes, it was Adams. And so... We, we know the methods of, of uh, Sherlock Holmes when he's on a case. Uh, we've seen so many, uh, so many stories and cases where uh, Sherlock just throws himself, uh, his, his, his full attention. Um, he'll, he'll be up for hours and days and weeks and uh, can find himself uh, physically exhausted and all, all of these things. Um, and we were hearing that there's a case that was extremely difficult um, that, that Sherlock solved um, most likely through great mental and physical effort. And then we have a lazy, brilliant man that sits in a club reading periodicals in passing, seeing these different cases, thinking about his brother, and solving them, coming up with the right answer. It was Adams, of course. Sherlock, yeah, yeah. It took, it took me a while, but I got it. <laughs> um, and then, um, one of my favorite moments in all of these short stories is when we get the examples of Sherlock's brilliance. So um, he'll have a display where he'll take an everyday object or the person that walks into the apartment and just um, uh, unravel and take apart all of the details, put them back together and be able to um, extrapolate um, am amazing uh, powers of perception. And so 
Watson gets to see what happens when Sherlock and the smarter, <laughs> older brother of Mycroft decide to put on the same display. It's one of my favorite moments. They look out a window and they, they, they see a person pu pushing a carriage and they just have a back and forth. I I'd like to read it because it's just <laughs> amazing. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, the two men had stopped opposite the window. Some chalk marks over the waistcoat pocket were the only signs of... The other was a very small, dark fellow with his hat pushed back and uh, several packages under his arm. So we, we have the people outside. That part doesn't really matter. Sherlock begins. Uh, An old soldier, I perceive, said Sherlock. And very neatly, and very recently discharged, remarked the brother, Mycroft. Served in India, I see, Sherlock. And a non-commissioned officer, Mycroft. Royal artillery, I fancy, said Sherlock. And a widower, Mycroft. Uh, but with a child, Sherlock. Children, my dear boy, children. <laughs> And then uh, Watson's response to this, uh, he goes, Come, said I, laughing, this is a little too much. Just so satisfying and fun and ingenious. Uh, we, we have a new character, a new location, a new dynamic, and... Just so quickly, with a few bits of dialogue and an introduction, <laughs> we're just blown away with entertainment. I, I just, I just, I just love it. I just love that part. So, <laughs> at this point, um, Mycroft says to his brother Sherlock, um, "There is a case that you might be interested that I heard about. Someone in the in the." Diogenes Club um, recently told me something that might be of interest uh, to you. And um, the person is called, and it's it's a Greek interpreter, works in London, uh, interprets, we're told, all the languages, but uh, since he's of Greek origin, does specialize in translating uh, Greek into English. And there is um, an appointment or an invitation where this Greek interpreter is taken into a carriage um, um, to, to, to go on a project to do a bit of translating. And very quickly, uh, we learn, and the Greek interpreter learns, that this carriage ride, for him, has turned into a kidnapping. Um, the windows of the carriage are blacked out with fabric. They also have the curtains pulled. He's being taken to um, a second location where he can not know um, where he's being taken to. It's um, strongly said that uh, if he says more than he should, if he speaks about this to anybody, uh, it will put him in grave danger. And he's brought into a dark, dark house. The, the lights are all out outside. The, the, the house has just the barest um, gas lamps on, just enough to throw silhouettes um, into the environment. And <clears throat> there's an interrogation scene where a victim is brought out, uh, clearly has been um, tortured, and has a plaster cast over his face. And um, the kidnappers want the Greek interpreter um, to speak to this um, kidnapped victim, who, who is Greek and doesn't know English. And so... 
the interpreter is going to speak in Greek. The victim is going to handwrite his answers. And it's this back and forth where uh, the kidnappers want information. This victim will not give the information. And our interpreter um, fairly quickly decides to be bold, to be brave, and um, realizes th these people don't speak Greek. And he can add questions at the end of each statement that they're wanting him to ask. And uh, we, we learn the, the, the victim's name. Uh, we learn what he doesn't know. He doesn't know where he is. Uh, he's in an unknown, lo an unknown location, just like uh, the interpreter. And it's cut short. And this is the tale that the interpreter uh, told Mycroft also told the police, which prompted advertisements in the papers looking for uh, this victim and his sister, who uh, is also in peril. Um, and there's a resolution in, 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 in that case, which is so far beside the point of the whole tale, it's, it's almost... Um, It's just beside the point. There's a word I'm trying to think of, and I can't think of it. But incidental. The the, the case and the resolution is incidental um, compared to um, the new location, um, the, the, the new character, Mycroft, the new location, the Diogenes Club, the new relationship where... Uh, we see a, a little burst of activity from the lazy Mycroft. He's now um, involved in the case and he shows up at Baker Street to the surprise of Sherlock and Watson. And it's just so good. It, it, it's one of my favorite short stories. J just uh, reading it again, uh, coming across these bits of dialogue that uh, I know by heart. Sherlock says, oh, he... he He's with child, Mycroft says. Children, my dear boy. Children. Because there was a deduction that Sherlock got right, but not quite right. But Mycroft did. I also, I, I love that Mycroft, the character, is not overused in these stories. He's not a new character that is now in every single Sherlock Holmes story. Um, I think he comes up maybe tw twice or three times in the whole of all in the whole of the short stories. But um, another great decision to just um, use it sparingly and have it in the background it makes it an even more iconic character. Um, so. <laughs> Um, you might tell that I'm just giddy re reading this short story. Uh, it's The Greek Interpreter by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, one of my favorite Sherlock stories. Let me know if you've read it. Um, thank you for watching. Please leave a comment if you would like. Thank you, uh, and take care. Bye.